the world's most honored watch is Longines. Longine watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and more honors for accuracy than any other timepiece. Longines, the world's most honored watch, is made and guaranteed by the Longines Whitnall Watch Company. It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the vital events of the hour, brought to you three times weekly. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. Fraser Hunt, famous American journalist, magazine writer, and commentator. And Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury. Our distinguished guest for this evening is General Bonner Fellers, famed strategist and psychological warfare leader. In this spontaneous and unrehearsed discussion, the opinions are necessarily those of the speakers. General <coughs> Fellers. Those of us who were in the Pacific, of course, remember that you were General MacArthur's planning officer. Isn't that correct, sir? That's correct, yes. For a time. And, and you have are known now as a critic of uh, some of our war planning. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. Now, sir, what uh, do you think is the essential problem of our country now uh, defensively? We must defend, we must be strong militarily, but we must fit that to our pocketbook, and we must also have that defense reflect the genius of America. We can no longer match uh, our enemy in manpower. We must substitute uh, brains and genius. Are, and we, are we opposed now, or our potential enemies now have more men than we have? We are outmanned now. Enormously. In the last war, we outnumbered our enemy about seven to one, we and our allies. And it's your theory, then, that we have to have, we have to plan accordingly. We have to plan not to oppose the enemy with manpower. That is correct. We can't oppose them with manpower because Moscow dominates 800 million of population. The NATO powers and ourselves are 300 million. We're on the short end of an eight to three ratio in manpower. Well, General Fellers, are, are we getting and planning for a real and genuine and adequate defense now? Mr. Hunt, I think we're not. We're in very bad shape in Korea. We're outnumbered on the ground and we're outnumbered in the air. Our program to hold Stalin out of Russia, of Europe, if he should attack, is wholly inadequate. We plan and hope to have, in two or three years, 60 Allied divisions. Stalin already has 200. He has 60 satellite divisions between the Red Army and our troops in Europe. So that uh, there is no way I see that you could call our program adequate. Well, how much is it costing us now, uh, uh, the annual budget on military The budget. budget this year, fiscal year 52, the year which ends June 30, 52, is now 75 billions of dollars mm. appropriated for our military plus our foreign aid. I thought it was 60 billion they advertised. 60, 60 billion for the military and 7.5 billion foreign aid and then 5.5 special weapons, atomic energy uh, for the military, two more billion. It totals 75 oh. already and that <coughs> doesn't include the war in Korea. That hasn't been yeah. figured in. Now, of course, sir, you, you, under, you recognize and you can see that we must spend a lot of money uh, in the world as it is now. Unfortunately, yes. To safeguard this nation. Yes, so, so the argument then is over just how the money shall be spent, isn't it? There are two things, yes. How the money shall be spent, and I think it's wrong for a long-range program which depends on deficit spending. Now, is it your view inflation. that we are now spending too much money? Yes, sir. And how do you propose to save money from what we are now spending? I'd like to say that the government calculates they'll collect about $62 billion in taxes. If we spend as much as has already been appropriated for military and foreign aid, 
We're 12 billion in the red, merely in the military spending. Well, now everybody's talking about economy and willing to cut, and they're always speaking of the domestic economy. How, how about this sacred cow of military, the uh, military budget? Is it a sacred cow? Doesn't, uh, uh, haven't we a right to question it? Uh, is it something that we don't dare even ask about? Why, Mr. Hunt, that uh, sacred cow of the military ought to be slaughtered. Well, that's... Uh, you can never give the militarists all they want. Well, how can we say not slaughtered, but just cut it down a little bit? Well, we have three branches, Army, Navy, and Air Force. The chiefs are loyal to these branches. They should be, and each naturally wants all he can get. That leads to splitting the budget roughly three ways. It doesn't give us enough for anyone, and as a result, we're spending ourselves to death, and we still don't have security. Our listeners, of course, are generally familiar with the term balanced defense, which was first introduced by Mr. Forrestal. Now, what is meant by a balanced defense, uh, as the term is now used, sir? As the term is now used, Mr. Huey, the chiefs would tell you that they must have enough money to perform their responsibilities, to fulfill them. But each chief interprets his responsibility as a major role in the war. Now so he wants all he can get. Well, now, is that balanced? Does that mean we, if we have $3, uh, out of every $3, we spend $1 for the Air Force, one for the Navy, one for the Army? It's worked out roughly that way to date, yes, sir. And your proposal is that we, we upset that balance? Yes, my proposal is this, that the Red Army is so large and fighting on its home territory, its home ground has winter and distance on its side and manpower in, inexhaustible, that we shouldn't try to match that on the ground in Europe. We're told that we're not matching it, but we really are if we intend to oppose it. So I would pare down on the army because we can't win the war on the ground. All right, now one, number one, you would cut down on the army. Now, I would number, cut down on the army. Number two, sir. The navy is greater than all the navies of the world. The enemy has no fleet except submarines. Therefore, the navy can be pared down and I'd have the army and the navy support the Air Force, supply the bases, defend the bases, and the Air Force built strong enough to dominate the sky over Russia, and once you get that, there won't be any war. Well, how much will that save if you do that? The Air Force needs about 30 billions of dollars for three or four years to build American air supremacy over Russia. each yes, year? Each well, year. Well, uh, how, how much then, uh, 30, that then how much be, should the Army and the Navy have? That would be raising the Air Force roughly about seven billion annually. The Army has 21 billion this year, the Navy 16, because the Navy already has its bases. The Air Force has more money for bases and the ground forces have more money for bases than the Navy. So you could cut the Army down, say, to 12 or 14 divisions. They're planning 33. We now have nothing like 14 divisions. 12 is actually, I think, the number. So that if you held the army down to a supporting role for the Air Force, you could cut it in two and in two or three would, years. And how much would you cut the Navy? Sir? I'd cut the Navy appropriation in half. It's in being already. I just have it operating, and I'd develop submarine, uh, anti-submarine techniques. And, and you, you would at least double the, the present Air Force expenditure then? No, the present Air Force expenditure this year is 23 billion. It needs only seven more for three or four years to build air suppression. So your balance then would be out of every five dollars, we'd spend about three dollars for the Air Force. And, and a two dollar for the th Army and the Navy. Uh, yes, two, two for the Army and Navy. And I would balance my force against the enemy. I'd avoid his strength and build a force to strike his weakness, which is his industry, well within but, uh, the... Uh, but would, would that give us a real air supremacy, then? That, uh, that I'm told that it will give us air supremacy. The Russian has certain definite limitations on his air program, and we can outbuild him with our industry and our genius. So yes. with this new plan of, of strategy, of, and that what, that's what it is, a great overall strategy, we would have, we would save possibly a third of what we're spending now and have what might be called a guaranteed defense. Is within that three years, we'll save a third. I believe within three years, we could have a military budget 40 or 45 billion. 
that would be sound, that would deter war. If war should come, it enables yes. us to win. Be much more effective than this. It would be more effective and now. it would be extending our allies more aid. Because if we don't have supremacy of the air, even if we had more than 60 divisions in Europe, we'd be defeated. Well then, General, uh, I believe then that you've made these points. That you think that it is possible now for us to reduce our expenditures almost in, in half and you would do it by drastically reducing the army, drastically reducing the navy and by increasing the air force and you would depend on our air force then and our uh, other aerial weapons uh, to safeguard this nation. I would. Today it's conceded by all leaders that the only real war deterrent is air power. I see. Well thank you very much for being with us sir and I hope you can be with us again. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. Fraser Hunt and Mr. William Bradford Huey. Our distinguished guest was General Bonner Fellers. This year, as for years past, the biggest sports event of the day, the World Series, will be timed by Longines watches. And at the polo grounds and at the Yankee Stadium, there may be seen the famous Longines clock, which is official timing for all sports events at these great arenas. And all umpires of both the National and the American Leagues use Longines watches exclusively for timing all the baseball games, including the World Series. Now, how important is timing to baseball? I put this question to National League umpire Jocko Conlon recently at the Polo Grounds in New York, and he said, well, timing the baseball game is very important. Uh, take, for instance, with the count three and two on the batter, and the pitcher refuses to throw the ball. After a warning from the umpire, 20 seconds time has elapsed, and he still refuses to pitch, you can call a ball. Therefore, it, when I say critical, it could be three men on base, three and two on the hitter, and it would be changed the ball game right there. Yes, time is important in baseball. And that's why, for the World Series, as well as for championship sports in every field, the official watch is the world's most honored watch. The reason? The greater accuracy and dependability of Longines watches, proven in scientific tests by the great observatories, proven in the day-to-day -day practical experience of millions of discriminating men and women all over the world. Longines, the world's most honored watch premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. The only watch in history to win 10 World's Fair Grand Prizes, 28 gold medals, and so many honors for accuracy in all fields of precise timing. This is Frank Knight reminding you that our program is brought to you three times weekly, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So won't you join us again Friday evening at this same time for The Longine Chronoscope, a television journal of the vital events of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longine, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longine, sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display the emblem Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. CBS Television Network.